got a long ways to go and a short time to get there. Eastbound, watch old Sherman run. We want to thank you for coming tonight to the study. We've taken a break from 1 Timothy and we're studying an episode in David's life. If you haven't been here, if you haven't watched the last two studies, they were um, last Wednesday night, last Sunday night, and it's on the uh, episode of David's life with Bathsheba. And I just want to line it out for you before we get started. Now, you've probably never heard anything like this, but I believe David raped Bathsheba. I believe Bathsheba was very, very young. I believe Bathsheba was a virgin. I believe she was Uriah's wife. But just like Mary was a spouse and Joseph's wife, in the Jewish custom, the engagement or being a spouse is just as legal and just as binding as the marriage. And I believe she was a spouse to be his wife, but Bathsheba means the daughter of an oath or the daughter of a vow or a daughter that's been sworn. And I think Uriah and David, uh, not Uriah, Uriah and Elam, Bathsheba's father, had made a vow, just like David and Jonathan did. And the covenant between them goes like this. If either one of us die in battle, the other one will take our family as their family and raise them. And I think that's what happened with Uriah. And I think Uriah um, probably had raised Bathsheba as his own with his own children and she was a spouse to be his wife and you're going to see why I believe that as the night unfolds um, I believe her father Elim was dead he's mentioned twice and only in the fact that he was her father but her grandfather is mentioned over and over and over over 20 times and a tremendous amount of information is given about her grandfather. And her grandfather was David's closest uh, advisor and confidant. He was his closest advisor when he um, took the place of the king from Saul. And so this Bathsheba is his granddaughter and you, you learn some things. So when uh, Absalom, David's son, is trying to kill his father to take the, the throne, Ahithophel, Bathsheba's grandfather, becomes his greatest ad advisor. And Absalom asks him point blank, you tell me what to do, and we will do it. And Bathsheba's grandfather says, here's what you need to do. You need to take the concubines and the wives of David that are left in the palace, and you need to have sex with them right out in public. You need to rape them. Well, why would an advisor tell Absalom to rape his daddy's wives? because I believe his granddaughter had been raped by David. And then her grandfather goes on and says, I tell you what, you need to do it on the very rooftop where David was standing when he saw Bathsheba naked. Now this ain't just all Kalinky dinks. It's all in there, but you got to hunt it up. So David has a son that rapes his half-sister. Amon rapes Tamar. Amon is Absalom's full sister. So Absalom is furious when he finds out and he goes to David and David does nothing about it. Well, you've got to ask yourself, why didn't David do something about it? Well, he couldn't do anything about it. He was guilty of the exact same sin. I also believe that everyone knew Something was up when David didn't go to war. I think all the men were talking. There's only one thing that David loved more than going to war and killing people, and that was sex. And so when 
Uriah gets the call to go back home, I'm sure they're all talking, oh no. I think Uriah knew exactly what had happened. I think that's why Uriah wouldn't go home, and I'll show you tonight in the scripture. David tells Uriah, why don't you just go home? He doesn't say anything about sleeping with his wife. And Uriah comes back and says, no, the men are fighting in the field. I will not go home. I will not eat and drink at my house and lay with my wife. He said, as your soul lives and you live, I shall not do this thing. Well, didn't anybody say anything about sleeping with his wife? I think Uriah had a decision to make. And on the long walk home, I think he decided and he weighed out his options. And his options were this. If David had raped her like he had raped a bunch of other girls, if he exposed it, then she would die. If she was a willing participant, it was adultery, she'd be stoned to death. Along with his King David. If King David had raped her, King David would be stoned to death, but she would be marked as a raped woman and an outcast in society. And I think Uriah made a decision that he loved her enough to die for. That's why he's a great type of Adam. And we'll see that tonight. Because in both cases you have a woman who's been wronged and a man who has not sinned and he chooses to die for her without being deceived. So let's just get into it. Proverbs 25, verse 2. There's always more to the story. I'm telling you, it's the, it's the greatest experience in your Christian walk is to have a relationship with God that is uh, revelatory, that he's revealing things in his word to you. If you don't have that, you're missing out. And the only thing you got to have to do that is to spend some time in the book. Okay? So watch this. It says it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. What, does, what in the cat hair does that mean? It's the glory of God to conceal a thing? That's the glory of God? That's one of God's greatest things? Yeah, he hides things. He's the world champion hide-and-go-seek player. He hides things. And if he hides from you, you can't find him. Watch this. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the honor of kings to search out a matter. Hey, listen, you're going to rule with Christ. You will rule and reign with him. It's your honor to search them out. But you have to search them out. God hides them. He wants to see, do you really want to know? He doesn't throw pearls to swine. He doesn't give the deep hidden things of God to people that don't care about them. Why don't you throw pearls to swine? Because they'll eat them just like it's corn. They don't know the difference. They're ignorant. That's why you don't take pearls, put them out there. They'll just, they'll just eat them. God doesn't throw the deep things of God out there for people that don't care. Look at Romans 3. We're going to start this off like it should be. Here it goes. <laughs> what then, Paul says, are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Well, hey, we're all sinners. Let's just get it all straight. Now, some of us, some of us are better than others, but we're all uh, without God. We're all sinners. Well, nobody has any right to look down their nose at anybody else. And that's what Paul's trying to make. So just in case you people that have never killed somebody thinking you was doing God's service want to look down your nose at him who has, he wants you to know you're a sinner too. And he's quoting David. So why did David write this? He wants you to know all you goody goodies that haven't done the terrible things he did, you're a sinner too. <laughs> We're all apart from God. We all need God. We were talking about it in, in our study in Jonah. In the book of Isaiah, it says, Our righteousness 
our filthy rags. Not our sin. Our righteousness are filthy rags to God. Our best efforts on our best day. When we're helping some old lady across the street, it's filthy rags. Watch what Paul says. As it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. Well, where is it written? Well, we'll show you. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. You did seek after God. He sought you out. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now, where is it written? Well, he's going to show you. It's in Psalms 53, first three verses. Watch this. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. Nobody. Billy Graham included. You know that silly Billy Graham? He let him give him an honorable 33rd degree Mason title. It, was he really evil or just ignorant? I don't know. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say he was just one big dummy. But before he died, he claimed that hell wasn't eternal. What did he have? Did, was he senile? Had he lost it? Or was he tricking us all from the get-go? Well, listen, he had his problems too. There's none good, no, not one. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand that did seek God. This is exactly what Paul quoted in Romans. Every one of them has gone back. They all together become filthy. There's none that doeth good. No, not one, David says. So David admits his guilt and admits his sin, but he wants you to know too, you're a sinner too. So look at John chapter 5, verse 39. What are we doing here? Why are we here? Why do we have our Bibles out? Jesus said, search the scriptures. That's a command. You need to search the scriptures. Now, this is an accusation. Now, if you have any other Bible but a King James Bible, don't roll your eyes. We'll poke them out. They take away the punctuation, and they make it one statement. And I want to tell you something. You don't probably recognize what that means, that's very, very evil. When you take away the punctuation, the whole thing's an accusation. You know what Jesus says if you take away the punctuation? It's a bad thing to search the scriptures. Now, I want to tell you something. A jot and a tittle can mean a whole lot. Now, all you women understand greater than the men. One time we had a couple come to my house. We were all going to go out to eat. When they walked in the living room, you could tell something was wrong in Barnesdall. And I'm like, oh, oh, these people, i have been married long enough to know something ain't right. This is going to be a long night at the Long Star Steakhouse. So in the most eloquent, charitable, Christian-loving way, I said, okay, we're not going anywhere until we get this out of the air, you know. What is wrong? And he said, oh, she's mad. And I said, well, everybody could tell that. Stevie Wonder could see that. I said, why are you mad? And I didn't say it, Chet, but I wanted to say again because she was always mad. She said, well, I went in there and I got dressed and I did my makeup and I did my hair. He said, four hours. And she said, I come out and I said, how do I look? And he said, fine. I said, what's wrong with that? And she said, he didn't say fine. He said, fine. <laughs> now, if inflection in your voice can mean that much, you got to know punctuation is very important. So Jesus makes a command and then a statement. He says, Search the scripture. And now this is the accusation against those people he's speaking to. He said, for in them you think you have eternal life. Do you have eternal life in the scripture? No. 
You have eternal life in Jesus Christ. You better watch what you worship. I know people that worship tongues. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says tongues are for a sign. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. So if all your whole life is about seeking after tongues, did Jesus just say you're spiritually an adulterer? See, he won't, he won't share his glory with nothing. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So every time you're in the Old Testament, you need to be looking for Jesus because every story, every verse, every chapter, every book is about him. So here we go. Got through the introduction? Just have an hour and a half to go. Here we go. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Watch this Bible come alive to you when you read it. Looking, searching, it's your honor. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David didn't go to battle. <laughs> David didn't go to battle. Who? David, David, that's all David is about, going to battle. But David sent Joab. Who's Joab? You need to ask yourself. He's David's right-hand man. He's his five-star general. He controls the whole army. David and Joab have killed more people. Uh, I started to say it in COVID, but anyway, I better watch that. Man, I'll be here all by myself. And this is the time when the kings go to battle, but David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. He's trying to get rid of all the men, is he? And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Why? Why would David stay back? He's 58 years old. He's in the prime of his life. Why don't he go to battle? David always goes to battle. I believe you can believe whatever you want to. He wanted to stay back to uh, binge watch some on Netflix or something. You can have any idea you want. I believe he had a plan. Now, I believe it wasn't the first time he walked out on his porch on the roof of his house. I don't believe it was the first time he had saw this young lady. I think she lived next door. She lived next door. I think he had seen her before. I think he had watched her. I think he had a plan. I think he knew what time it was. I think he was plotting. And it came to pass in an eventide. If you look that up, that's between 1 and 6 in the afternoon. So here's this David. He's got a plan. He's methodical. He's David, man. He's brilliant. He's a strategic genius. He has a plan. Why would a man like David take a nap in the middle of the day? Come on, people. There are some little kids in here, but they ain't paying no attention. They're like some of you. They're acting like their parents. Come on, think. Why would a fully grown man, a man's man, take a nap in the middle of the day? What? How many of you in here is nurses? Did you ever get shipped to the midnight shift? Huh? Because nurses they always got to work them goofy shifts, don't they? I know everybody in this room is thinking the same thing, but you're two big chickens. Why would a grown man take a nap in the middle of the day? Well, just like nurses, if you get you get told while you're at work one day, you're working 12 hours, you're like, oh yeah, by the way, Tomorrow you're going to be on midnights. <laughs> well, that afternoon you might need to take a nap. <laughs> well, just so happened, it came to pass in the middle of the afternoon, David took a nap, and he arose from his bed. Did David think maybe he was going to have a long night? I don't know, but there's always more to the story, and it's your honor to dig it out. He arose from his bed and he walked upon the roof of the king's house. 
What's he doing walking out there in the hot spring in the Middle East on top of a hot roof? And from the roof of, he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Let me tell you something. No, I will not say it. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba? Now, I think there were people under David's employment that he had sent multiple times to inquire after a woman, which is a nice way of saying, go get me that woman. And then one person said, one what? One of the people that he sent said, is not this Bathsheba? Now listen, this isn't something done in secret. There's a lot of people involved. How many people did he send to go get her? How many people did she have at her house? Did she have servants? Of course she had servants. Come on, her house is next door to the palace. Was she taking a bath by herself, just her and the duck? No, you're going to find out later it wasn't a bath. It was a baptism. It was a ceremonial cleansing bath a mikvah pool baptism. Oh, come on. David sent and inquired after the woman. He said, hey, hey, you guys go get this woman. And one of those people said, is not this Bathsheba? Because he always sends us to go get women so he can have sex with them. Isn't this Bathsheba the daughter of Elam? The wife of Uriah the Hittite? Verse 4. And David sent messengers and took her. And that word in the Hebrew means took her. It's the same word used of the fallen angels that took the women to be their wives. Listen, when the fallen angels fell to earth, the fathers of those women weren't just given their daughter's hand in marriage. They were took. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanliness, and she returned into her house. What does that mean, she was purified from her uncleanliness? Well, every month, there's a period in the month, I hope you caught it, where women in the Hebrew customs were unclean. For seven days, they were deemed unclean. After the end of that period of time, then they had to go through a baptism. In a mikvah pool, they would have had to have washed themselves and submerged themselves. When they come up out of the pool, they were ceremonially clean. They could touch things, and those things were not unclean. They could handle their children. They could touch their husband. They could cook dinner. But before that, they were deemed unclean. David sees that she's not taking a shower She's going through a ceremonial, ritualistic cleansing. So he knows she's clean, and all you women know, she's also the most fertile myrtle on the block. Verse 5, And the woman conceived, well, what do you know? And sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Now, we don't want to assume anything. But I don't think David cared. See, I'm under the belief that I don't think David really cared about her. Now, the movies in Hollywood portray it that David forsook all his other wives after Bathsheba, and it was just her and Bathsheba, and it was a love story, and they were um, monogamous like two turtle doves for the rest of his life. That's not scriptural, and that's not true. I don't think he really cared about her. And I don't think he really cared if she got pregnant. Uriah's a Gentile anyway. So I believe he raped her. So now we have a clean woman, purified, 
from her uncleanness. We have a clean woman made unclean. And now she's a dead woman. Where else can you find in the Bible a clean woman made unclean and now she's dead? Well, I don't have time. It's Eve. Eve was sinless. Eve was clean, cleaner than anything you can imagine. The Bible says Eve was clothed in the glory of God, which was a light. Eve had a shining covering, clothed in God's glory, and she was made unclean. And I don't know what you think about it, but the Bible says she was completely and wholly seduced by the devil. And then she was made filthy and unclean and dead. Now, Eve was still walking around, but according to God, she was dead. Bathsheba walked back to her house, but the law said she was a dead woman. And if word comes out and finds out, she would have been stoned to death. So when you're looking for Jesus, you're looking for all these types. In the book of Hosea, the Bible says God spoke to his people through similitudes. Why does the Holy Spirit put these words worded like this so that you can catch the clues? Now you're in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Now you're also with Mary and Joseph. And just like Adam, Uriah was not deceived. I don't think Uriah was deceived in any way, shape, or form. Look at 1 Timothy 2.14. See, you didn't think we was in 1 Timothy, but we were. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam was not deceived. I can't hammer that into your head hard enough. He walked back up there. Eve has lost her covering. He does not know exactly what that means, death. He'd never seen death, but God told him, the day you eat of this, you will surely die. But he made a decision. He had a decision to make. He weighed out his options. And you know what he tells God? He's not putting the blame on her. He's confessing to God. He says, God, the woman you gave me to take care of, she ate. Then she gave it to me and I ate. He's not blaming her. He's confessing. You gave me to be responsible over her and I allowed her to be tricked and deceived, and she died. And so I decided, I made a decision. I weighed out my options, and I didn't know what it was going to mean, but I loved her enough to die for her. And I didn't want her to go through whatever that death is by herself, so I chose to go with her. It was my fault anyway, because I was responsible to take care of her. I think Uriah weighed out the same option. Well, I could expose them all, but then she would die. Look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 1, 18, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example to be stoned to death, he thought about just putting her away privately. He thought maybe he could get away with it and nobody would know. And you can't really blame him. But when the angel Gabriel came and shared with him God's plan, he changed his thinking. But you got to admit, that would be hard to believe if you were Joseph. This young girl's a spouse to you, she's engaged to you, and she comes to you and she's like, Hey, Joseph, uh, can we talk? And Joseph would be like, Yeah, baby, we can talk. What do you want to talk about? Well, Joseph, uh, I'm, well, I'm pregnant. But it's not like you think. <laughs> You're what? 
Well, I'm pregnant, but I've never been with another man. Oh, sure you haven't. What is it like, immaculate? Well, yeah, matter of fact, it is, yeah. Well, that'd be hard to believe. So it takes an angel from God. Joseph believes in. And what a great man of God Joseph was. Can't wait to meet him. So Joseph had some options. Joseph had to make a decision. And what he chose was to die with her. You say, Joseph didn't die. Joseph died. Let me let you in on it. The last time you hear about Joseph is Jesus is about 13 years old, 12. You think Joseph was in his carpenter shop building a little table and a chair while Jesus is being hung on a cross? No, Joseph's gone. But the rest of Joseph's life was lived running and hiding and in obscurity and with the whispers of the crowd. Any aspirations Joseph had for a normal life went out the window. So 2 Samuel 11, we're back in the story of David, verse 10. And I want you to see this thing, this little phrase, this thing keeps coming up, coming up, coming up. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down into his house, David told him the, day, the night before, go back to your house and we'll talk tomorrow. David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from the, thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down into thine house? He don't say nothing about sleeping with nobody. And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink? and to lie with my wife. Where did that come from? He said, as thou livest and as thy soul livest, I will not do this thing. This thing becomes a way of describing whatever it was that David did. Look at 2 Samuel. Skip on down to verse 25 and 27. Watch this. Then David said unto the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab. So Joab is receiving a message from David to put Uriah at the heat of the battle and retract from him and allow Joab to be overrun by the men, the valiant fighters, and kill him. Joab doesn't do that. The reason why I believe Joab doesn't do that is out of honor for Uriah Uriah was a mighty, mighty warrior, and it would have been disgraceful for him to be overtaken and killed by just sheer numbers of men. So what Joab does is he puts him up too close to the wall, and the archers kill him with the bows and arrows, which was a way more respectable way to go out. When David hears about it, David said unto the messenger, Just shall thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee. He's telling Joab, Don't let your part of this thing, whatever this thing is, bother you. Don't let it displease you. He just has killed a man. David has had a man killed by someone else. His best friend. David does not care for Uriah. He says to Joab, don't let this thing upset you, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Hey, people die in battle, man. Don't let this bother you. Make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it. So now we're going to switch to chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 5. And David's anger... Let's go back. Um, Kenny, if you can, and start in chapter 12, verse 1. So the next chapter, chapter 12, begins with the man of God, Nathan, coming to David. This Bathsheba has been now married through a ceremony with David. 
after Uriah, her husband, has been killed in battle, and now she's given birth to this baby. She's about nine months pregnant, and the man of God comes to David. Watch what he says. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and he said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. Now remember, the word of God, every word is there for a reason. If you want to know where I get some of these wild ideals I believe, you're fixing to read them. You can make up your own mind. But these words are in here for you to uncover. Watch. There's one rich and there's another poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. The poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb. Now why is it one little ewe lamb? A ewe lamb is a female lamb before it's had a lambing, before it's had a baby lamb. Now, if you know anything about animals, this means a ewe lamb is a baby female lamb that hasn't ever been exposed to a male ram. Everybody with me? God, this is hard. I make this look easy, but it is very difficult. So why? Well, you know the similarities. So is Bathsheba a ewe lamb? Well, I think so. You just read it. So this poor guy had one little ewe lamb. Now that's enough, but notice what God sends him to say which he had brought and nursed up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. Well, that's just a bunch of extra stuff that doesn't need to be said unless it's very important. Did this little ewe lamb, Bathsheba, was she raised by Uriah because she's the daughter of an oath? Remember, the Hebrew people had names. They'd have three or four names, and usually one name meant something. It, it was the tale of their life. Was this one little ewe lamb, this little virgin girl, raised by Uriah? Was Uriah 58 like David? Was she 14, 15? Was she raised with his children? Did he have other children? The Bible doesn't tell you he doesn't. Did he have other wives? All of them had other wives. It was like a Latter-day Saint. Watch. Easy, she grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat. Let me let you in on something. You lambs don't eat meat. And drank of his own cup. Now, I know some of you sickos out there have your little dog that, you know, licks out of your cup and you know, eats off your tail. That's okay, that's you. You do whatever you want to. Some of you even have cats. But most people don't have a ewe lamb in their lap drinking out of their own cup. And it lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd. So someone called in this um, parable is the traveler. And the traveler came to the rich man and talked the rich man into taking the poor man's ewe lamb and not taking one of his own. So the rich man, and he spared to take of his, spared to take of his own flock, of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man, the traveling man, that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb, and he dressed it for the man that was come to him. He killed it. He used it to satisfy the traveling man, the wayfaring man. Verse 5, And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Well, boy, you said it there, David. 
and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing. And because he had no pity. Remember I told you, I don't think David cared. Well, where do you get that? Right there. Verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom. And I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover had given unto thee such as such things. I would have given you anything, David. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandments of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. He killed him with someone else's sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. You've caused the children of Ammon to kill him. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I'll raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, you need to read that again. God tells him, because of what you've done, I'll raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I'll take thy wife before thine eyes, and I'll give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wife in the sight of this son. For that thou didst in secretly, but I will do uh, this thing, this thing, before all Israel and before the sun. Skip on down to verse 21. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this thing that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. So, the baby dies. So I'm a literalist. So when the Bible says something that could be taken literal, I do it every time. That's the way the people studied the Bible for thousands of years until they got too smart. And they started what they call spiritualizing things that they didn't have enough faith to believe. We're studying in the book of Jonah, and we think it's very strange that there's two books in the Bible that take the most criticism from the theologians, from the seminary professors. They are Daniel and Jonah. And it just so happens that there's two books of the Bible that Jesus authenticated for us, and that's Daniel and Jonah. The reason why they don't believe Daniel could have been written by Daniel is because it's so accurate. The history that happened after the book of Daniel is prophesied so accurately, they say no man could get that accurate. Well, they don't believe in God. They're professors in seminaries, and they do not believe in God. So I take it literally every time. That's how people study the Bible. For thousands of years, they believed the Bible was coded. It was a coded message. I believe it's a coded message. And I believe every word and every punctuation was there by God's design. And I believe men and women can't understand it or break the code or understand it with their own intelligence. It's hidden from them. Remember, it's the glory of God to hide a thing. It takes the Holy Spirit of God to interpret the Bible. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I'm going to prove it to you. Watch. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit of God, it's foolishness. 
For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Where are the deep things of God found? In his word. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Who could share with you the deep hidden things of the spirit of God? The spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know what for? That we might know the things that are freely given to us by the Spirit of God, of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. This is all spiritual. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can, they be, can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So it's a spiritually discerned thing. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So you understand the Bible through a spiritual transaction. Look at Hebrews 4.12. Now this is a statement about a book. <laughs> There's 50 million books in the Library of Congress. There's one book that is set apart. Look at what the Bible says about itself. For the Word of God is quick, and it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. What's it do? Pierces even to dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. What? How in the world? What? How many of you know Colossians talks about a operation made without hands, this sword that cuts away your soul and spirit from your flesh. What? What is this book? What are you talking about, this book? And of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This book says it discerns your thoughts and your intents of the reader before you read it. Now that can be for good and evil. How many times have you sat down, you went to read the Bible, and it spoke to you, we was talking about this with some people the other day, differently than it did before. It's the same scripture, the same ink, the same words, but this time you'd lost a parent, or you'd lost a loved one, and the words were different for you. Well, it discerns your thoughts, and it knew the intent of your heart when you came to it. What if you're trying to use the book and you're trying to prove some false doctrine? It knows it. How does it know it? It's a spiritual thing, people. So it's some kind of a mind-reading book? I guess so, right? Look at Jeremiah 32, 4 and 5. Look at what Jeremiah 32, 4 and 5. This is a Bible study, ain't it? And, and Jedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. So this is a prophecy of Jeremiah that Jedekiah, the king of Judah, is going to be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon and shall speak with him mouth to mouth, and his eyes shall behold his eyes. Look at verse 5. This is a crazy prophecy. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon. And there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord, though he fight with the Chaldeans, ye shall not prosper. So Jeremiah says, you know what? Zedekiah is going to be led to Babylon, and the king and him are going to see eye to eye. Well, at the same time, Ezekiel's prophesying in Ezekiel 12, 13. Look what it says. My net also will I spread upon him, talking about Zedekiah, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he shall die there. We're talking about taking the Bible literal. Well, how in the world could he be taken to Babylon, see the king of Babylon eye to eye, and yet die there but never see it? 2 Kings 25, 5 through 7. Watch this. And the armies of the Chaldeans pursued after the king, and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. This is talking about Zedekiah. 
So they took the king and they brought him up to the king of Babylon to uh, Riblah and they gave judgment upon him. So now he's been taken to Babylon and they slew the sons of, of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. See, you read the prophecy of Jeremiah that he would be taken to Babylon. You read the prophecy in Ezekiel that he would never see it but die there. And you thought maybe it needed to be spiritualized. But it needed to be taken every word for literal basis because he was taken to Babylon and he did die there and he never saw it because they put his eyes out. So back to 2 Samuel. Look at verse 6. 2 Samuel 12, verse 6, Kenny. Sorry I'm jumping around for you. David says this, the man that done this, the man that took this poor man's ewe lamb and slayed it for the traveler, the wayfaring man, he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Well, David's quoting scripture. How many of you know David's quoting scripture without having a Bible or a phone? Look at Exodus 22, 1. David knows his scripture. We're moving fast. Hang in here. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. David's quoting scripture. He said, this man that took this man's little ewe lamb, he's going to have to repay him four lambs. Well, David's prophesying against himself because there were four sons of David that died because of this thing. This thing, whatever it was he did with Bathsheba, cost him the lives of four of his sons. And just like he prophesied and told Nathan, this man's going to repay that poor man four times. The first one is the baby from the rape. The second one is his son Amon, who raped his sister Tamar. The third one is his son Absalom. The fourth one is his son our nephew, Amasa. What would you say if every one of these four have something to say about David's sin? The baby, of course, dies because of the rape of Bathsheba. Amon, he was killed by being abandoned by his fellows. Absalom calls him to a party and Amon's friends, like Uriah's, retreated from him. And just like David got other people to do his dirty work and kill Uriah, his son Absalom got other people to kill his brother Amon, who had been retreated from his friends. The third one, Absalom, is killed in battle, just like Uriah. The fourth one, Amasa, is killed by a pretender friend with a kiss. Amasa's trying to take the kingdom from Solomon. And Joab, David's right-hand man, pretends to be his friend. He hides his dagger or sword in his coat that he has tied up. And he gets up real close to Amasa. And Amasa doesn't see the sword because... Joab's got a hold of his beard to give him a kiss. And the Bible says when he's given a kiss, Amasa doesn't see the sword of Joab that cut his guts out. And he lay in the highway in a pool of his blood. So the innocent child dies for the guilty. Go to 2 Samuel 12, 7 through 18. Where else do you see an innocent child dying for the guilty? And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man, 
Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee the master's house, the master's wives, to your bosom, the house of Israel, Judah, and if I had been too little, I would have moreover given thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in the sight, and hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon? Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I'll raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I'll take thy wife before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wife in the sight of this son. For thou didst it in secret, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because of this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall, shall surely die. Well, that don't seem fair, does it? And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child. The Lord struck the child. Someone call Oral Roberts, the Lord struck the child. That Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted. And he went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went in to him, and raised him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day, why does he die on the seventh day? That the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, he spake unto him. We spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? They're afraid he's going to kill himself. So the innocent child dies for the guilty. Where else do we see a virgin give birth to a boy child that was born to die? So later, Bathsheba gives birth to Solomon. This first baby is a type of Jesus in his first coming. Solomon is a, the greatest type, one of the greatest types of Jesus as the wise king. So the baby that dies is Jesus in his first coming, and Solomon is a type of Jesus in his second coming. So let's finish. Verse 18, 2 Samuel 12, 18, it says, How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead. Verse 19. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself, and he changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. Let me ask you something. If you've been through this thing that David has been through and your baby has just died that's seven days old and for seven days you've prayed and you've fasted and you've been on the ground and you've begged God to kill you instead of killing this baby and the baby died, would it have been the first thing you would have chosen to do would have been to worship God? What makes David a man after God's own heart? You've got to uncover what makes David, what sets him apart from everybody else in spite of his gross sin. David had a perspective of things. Would you have worshipped? Or would you have mourned for days and weeks and months until it finally become a little thing between you and God where you questioned God and you shook your fist at God and you said, why God? 
David doesn't do that. He goes and he worships. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. Doesn't make sense, David. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he's dead. Wherefore should I fast? Why should I keep fasting? Can I bring him back again? Rhetorical question, and the answer is no. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Watch this. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah, because of the Lord. And Jedidiah means beloved of God. It's a dastardly weave that we weave. But I want to leave you with some homework. In Nathan's parable, <clears throat> the rich man of course, it's David. And the poor man is obviously Uriah. And the little ewe lamb raised up by the poor man is undoubtedly Bathsheba. But your homework assignment for tonight, if you're willing to take it, is who is the wayfaring man? Who is the traveler? Who is the wayfaring man that caused the rich man to take the poor man's little ewe lamb. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these stories that are there for our learning and our admiration. Help us to realize that there's none good, no, not one. But we need to strive to be followers of you in all this cesspool of sin. The Bible says that David lived righteous except in one place in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And if you take this story and you look at what God told Nathan to tell him, the words of God, the thing that God pointed out to David was it was your sin that gave an opportunity to the enemies of God to blaspheme. God help us that our lives never give an opportunity for those that hate you and despise you to blaspheme your name. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks.